thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for, for those kind words, and thank you for the invitation to speak. I'm delighted to be here in this magnificent room. Unfortunately, I never got to see the, the Senate in action before it was abolished in 1972, but it certainly brings home to me the fact that there is uh, another Senate uh, on this island which is under, under the axe, under possible sentence of death. Um, lo looking at the, the impressive research done by um, the uh, officials of the Assembly, uh, I noticed here, it just sort of leapt out on me, um, uh, a statement by uh, Deputy J Joe Higgins uh, in Dáil Éireann that on the 100th anniversary of the 1913 lockout, the Dáil salutes the Titanic study struggle of the working classes of Dublin. That word Titanic, of course, is much uh, associated with, with Belfast in, in recent years. But it has been associated, too, with the, the, uh, with the lockout, and people have seen it in these terms as a clash between these titans, uh, William Martin Murphy, leader of the Dublin employers, and uh, Jim Larkin. And both certainly were uh, titans. I mean, M M Murphy was far and away the most dynamic uh, entrepreneur that Nationalist Ireland had produced, and uh, it was a bit of an embarrassment to Nationalists that they were so lacking in entrepreneur, entrepreneurs and, and capitalists compared with the, the unionist tradition in the 19th and early 20th century. And Murphy was often cited as the sort of person that uh, the future Ireland, particularly a self-governing home rule Ireland, which people expected in 1913, uh, should have, because he was far and away uh, Dublin's uh, most important employer. He owned the independent newspaper group, Cleary's department store, uh, the Imperial Hotel. Uh, he owned the tramway company, of course. Uh, but he, he had also in the, put money into developing uh, light rail in Argentina and West Africa uh, and in London. So he was um, seen as uh, quite a, an enterprising and far-sighted uh, in, individual and was very much the leader of the, the Dublin employers, so many of whom were Protestants and a bit sceptical about Catholics, particularly given that Murphy had a background as a nationalist politician. He had been a nationalist MP at one point. But uh, such was his acumen and uh, dynamism that he was the, the accepted leader of the Dublin uh, employers. And then, of course, Larkin was far and away regarded as a very dynamic and titanic figure and uh, is often spoken about in, in those terms as if Larkinism was, uh, you know, the product of Larkin's personality. He, you know, he's, the, the people talked about Larkin as a, a, a human tornado, as, um, uh, you know, a whirlwind who could completely transform uh, the Irish labour movement, or indeed as a messiah, which is a, a kind of theme that um, uh, James Plunkett uses a bit in Strumpet City. In fact, one of the slum dwellers in Strumpet City actually says, pointing to Larkin, there goes Jesus Christ. So there was that image that, uh, you know, Larkin was somebody sent by God to, to help the, the Dublin working class. And of course, people did live in terrible conditions. And I think um, this, this is the kind of second image that, that people have of the lockout, the slums. And the, the idea is that the, the, the risen people came out of the slums to challenge uh, plutocracy and the excesses of uh, wealth and poverty that, that affected Dublin. And certainly the slums loomed very large in the, image, in the imagery of Dublin at, at the time. Uh, nationalists were very embarrassed by the state of, of the capital. And they, they saw it as a metaphor for the moral decay of the nation under British rule. Uh, unionists, on the other hand, like to point out that there were very few slums in, in Belfast uh, and that the, the working class were generally housed better uh, in Unionist Ireland than in Nationalist Ireland. Uh, Belfast Corporation had been quite uh, enterprising in, uh, in the late 19th century, building about uh, 50,000 new houses and all these little coronation streets that we still see uh, as characteristic of the Belfast suburbs. So uh, less than 1% of the people lived in overcrowded conditions in Belfast, compared with 30% in, in Dublin. And the, um, the, mortality, the infant mortality rate in Dublin was one of the highest in, in the British Empire. It exceeded, uh, I think, in places like New Delhi and Calcutta, uh, other cities of the empire in those days. 
But is that really what the lockout was about? You know, was it this titanic personalised clash between Larkin and Murphy? And was it that the risen people came out of the slums to challenge their, their conditions? All uh, capital, I mean, was it about Dublin is, is another question. I mean, all capital cities tend to be obsessed with themselves, as indeed we, we know only too well in Derry. But before I'm accused of being a whinger, Mr. Speaker, I better not continue on that line. But, you know, is, is it just about Dublin or uh, is there a wider national or, or and indeed international perspective? Uh, so I want to argue that it's, it's, it's wider than... Um, uh, William Martin Murphy and Jim Larkin, that it's not the slums. In fact, I would argue the slums really had nothing to do with it. It's, it's, it's essentially, it, it was an industrial dispute. And it certainly, uh, there was a national and indeed um, an international context. So uh, to understand Larkin, uh, to understand Larkinism, I, I think, um, and why the employers were, were so hostile to it, I'll not say a little bit about Larkin and his background. He was born in Liverpool in 1874. Uh, both of his parents came from around Newry, and he would claim, after he came to Ireland at least, that he'd been born in Tamnahari in, in South Down with, with his, his mother's people. But most scholars don't accept this. It's certainly known that he spoke with a broad Liverpool accent, and people who knew him in Liverpool assumed that he had been born uh, in, in Liverpool. He was a big, you know, strapping lad. He didn't like school at all. He left school as soon as he could at the age of 11. He went through a series of odd jobs. And then about 16, he, he, he got a job on the Liverpool docks. And he, um, he, he, he sort of found his vocation on, on the docks. It was kind of work that, that suited him. The, the casualness of dockland employment at the time was much deplored by... Uh, social reformers. Dockers were kind of notorious for drunkenness and violence and their general uh, lifestyle. And a lot of this was, was blamed on the, the casual system. But actually, a lot of dockers kind of liked the freedom that casualism conferred on them because, um, you know, they, they, they could work when, when, when they wanted, uh, provided, of course, they, were, they, they had the money or they, they had the strength. But, I mean, there was that kind of macho culture on, on the docks and dockers took a pride you know, in the, in the survival of the fittest. And Larkin was very much reflective of that kind of background. So he uh, became a four-man docker. But in 1905, he, he joined a strike uh, at Harrison's, the company he worked with, and he lost his job. But his talents as a speaker were recognised. He had this great booming voice. He had this natural fluency. He could talk for two or three hours uh, without notes. Uh, he was just a remarkably gifted uh, orator. And he was also a bundle of energy. Uh, so he was, you know, he was constantly thinking up new ideas. He had very fertile uh, imagination. He was very dramatic, very personal. He was just a natural commander uh, of men. So he was made an organiser with the National Union of Dock Labourers in Liverpool by this man, James Sexton. And... The National Union of Dock Labour is actually known in, in England as, as the Irish Union because there were so many Irish in it at, at all levels. And Sexton came from a very similar background to, to Larkin. Uh, in Sexton's case, both his parents had been Irish. Uh, they, they settled in Tyneside but la later moved to, uh, to, to Merseyside. And Sexton then became General Secretary of, of this union. So Sexton, uh, he sent... Larkin off um, organising in England and Scotland for two years. And yet we don't talk about Larkinism in England and Scotland. So Larkin became an ism uh, in, in Ireland. And you know, that wasn't simply because of his, his personality. It, it was circumstances um, in Ireland that, that created, that, you know, created this, this ism. So in uh, January 1907, the British Labour Party was holding its annual conference in Belfast, which itself was an indication, I suppose, of Britain's, of, of Belfast's kind of industrial prowess at the time. And uh, Larkin was a member of the party and he was sent as a delegate. So Sexton thought this would be a good opportunity to uh, organise or reorganise the Irish ports. Most of the ports uh, had been organised by the National Union of Dock Labourers in the 1890s, but... 
a lot of their, their branches had, uh, had, had fallen away. Uh, Belfast was the obvious place to start, I mean, not only because of the Labour Party conference, but also because it was far and away the most industrialised city in Ireland. And Larkin, uh, he made his mark there in the summer of 1907 with the general uh, Dockers and Carter strike. To begin with, um, Sexton wanted to confine organisation to, to Dockers because he, he believed that the union really couldn't afford to be militant because the, the, the shipping federation was notoriously uh, anti-trade union. It even had its own navy. It maintained a fleet of six ships, the ferry scabs about. So um, wherever there would be a strike, they would simply you know, transport in uh, the, the strike breakers. They could be housed on ships, so that would minimise the possibility of conflict with uh, people who lived in the town. And in this way, strikes uh, could be broken. So uh, a lot of militant unions that emerged at the time of the new unionism, as it was called, this is the kind of new wave of trade unionism, um, roughly 1889 to 1891, they had been uh, broken uh, through employer militancy. But the National Union of Dock Labourers had survived, and Sexton believed that they'd, they'd done this by, by not pushing the employers too, too far, by avoiding strikes, if at all possible, and trying to win wage improvements you know, through legal action or through mobilising politicians and generating uh, pu public, public sympathy. So Sexton believed that this, this is the way to go, and Larkin did try to employ that, that policy to begin with. But he soon found that other workers wanted to join, you know, carters, uh, general labourers. And by June of 1907, he decided that uh, th this, in fact, was, uh, it, it would be better to get these people into the union and get them all collaborating together through sympathetic action. And he argued, well, you know, employers support each other in strikes. You know, wh why shouldn't workers? So he called a, a general strike in the port of Belfast in the summer of 1907. And this was really remarkable. It was something which hadn't happened before in, uh, in Irish labour history. But what made the strike particularly remarkable, and this is almost unique, I haven't come across similar references to it, was that the police mutinied at one point. They, they refused to work with the strike breakers and they joined the strikers. And this sent you know, shockwaves through uh, political circles. The government brought warships into Belfast Lock and rushed 6,000 troops uh, in, into the city. So here we see an, uh, a picture of, of Larkin uh, standing uh, at, a, at a, 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 a strike meeting. And obviously you can see that uh, there are a lot of people there, but you notice also that they're wearing the, 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 the cloth caps, the flat caps, which would have been associated with laborers or unskilled workers. Uh, craftsmen would have worn bowler hats, which is why the orange men wear bowler hats, because they were a symbol of respectability. But you notice the guy directly behind Larkin is wearing, um, he's wearing a straw hat. And he was Alex Boyd, who was leader of the Independent Orange Order, which had broken away from the mainstream Orange Order in 1902 and had gone through a sort of a radical phase and supported the strikers and uh, actually held collections for, for the strike uh, on the 12th of July uh, in, in Belfast. But I mentioned Belfast as well because, <clears throat> not only because because it, it, this is where Larkinism started, but because housing was so good in Belfast. You know, you had these um, 50,000 new purpose-built houses. And by our standards, of course, these little coronation streets would be, be quite small. But compared to what most workers in Europe were living in at the time, the housing was, was relatively good because on, on the continent, um, most work, uh, workers' families would have lived in, in one-room apartments, you know, where your washing facilities were uh, down the corridor. So having your own little house, um, you know, two up, two down, I mean, that, that was a huge improvement on uh, what people were used to, and certainly um, a lot better than living in, you know, a mud wall thatched cottage with an earthen floor where you cooked over an open fire, which would have been what a lot of people would have been used to previously. Or what you got in Dublin, which is very often one room in a tenement house, 
which had been abandoned by the gentry sometime in the 19th century and then broken up and let out into, uh, in, into flats. And sometimes you didn't even get one room. You know, you, there were cases of families sharing a room, in which case you just put a clothesline across the middle of the room and that provided you with the only uh, privacy that you had. So uh, there's no doubt but that housing conditions in Dublin were really appalling. But I, I just don't see it as, uh, you know, as an explanation of, of Larkinism, because I say it started in Belfast, where housing was pretty good. So by the end of the summer of 1907, uh, Larkin was, was a household name uh, throughout Ireland and indeed beyond, and people were starting to talk about Larkinism. His employers have coined the term Larkinism to distinguish it from what they called bona fide trade unionism. And by Larkinism, especially, they meant the sympathetic strike. You know, they also meant things like the attempt to unionize unskilled workers, which they were against. They accepted unions of craftsmen, because the craftsman was supposed to be responsible and respectable. But the, the unskilled man, you know, he lived a hand-to-mouth existence. He really couldn't afford to put any money aside, which meant, you know, as far as the employers were concerned, he had nothing to lose. These people were dangerous especially if you gave them a weapon like trade unionism, and especially if trade unionism you know, were, were, uh, was going to employ a weapon like the sympathetic strike. I mean, this was like you know, a nu the nuclear option uh, as far as industrial relations was concerned. It was, it was a, a new development, and it threatened to revolutionize industrial relations you know, in the same way uh, as you know, the longbow had revolutionized warfare in the Middle Ages, or you know, iron battleships had revolutionized naval warfare in, in the 20th century, in the 19th century. It was, it, it, some, you know, it was that dramatic. So employers felt um, this Larkinism you know, couldn't be accepted. And by Larkinism, they also meant you know, the cult of the agitator. You know, they said, you know, who is this guy? You know, he's, he's not even from Ireland. He comes out here with his... Uh, Liverpool accent. He's a professional, full-time agitator. You know, he's got an interest in creating trouble. And, you know, he'll stir things up and then he'll move on somewhere else. So this, again, was, was a new development because most of the craft unions before that had part-time officials. You know, full-time officials were relatively rare. Um, in fact, it's one of the ironies of the general unions when they developed that they needed a small army of full-time officials to hold them together. You, 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 could, you could hold a craft union together quite easily because it was defined by its craft and it, there was an apprenticeship system there to, uh, you know, to, 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 to regularise entry into the trade. But you know, if, with a docker, anyone could become a docker uh, you know, if you're if you young enough and strong enough. So it, it was much harder to hold those kinds of workers together um, so you, you needed this small army of full-time officials. But what was happening um, in Ireland has to be seen in the international context. I think so often Irish history reflects international trends. And you know, there's a tendency, I think, in the academic community to sort of see Ireland as being very kind of sui generis that you know, what happened in Ireland simply reflects uh, Irish circumstances and it's it's very insular and so on. But so often, I think, yeah, Ireland's been relatively globalised since the late 18th century, uh, chiefly because of the English language and immigration. And this means that, that Ireland was always very open to external influences. So here we see um, just a brief resume of the international unrest of the early t t 20th century. Um, 1902, 1904, general strikes. Uh, then you had big strikes in the German, Ru uh, Russian textile uh, factories. The attempted revolution in Russia in 1905 when Russia was defeated by Japan, which itself was an extraordinary event to have a major European power defeated by an Asian power. Um, 1907, a peasant revolt in Romania leading to deaths of 20,000 people. And then you, you had the anti-clericalism in Spain and, and also in Portugal. Um, unrest in Barcelona led to an anti-clerical revolt. The Portuguese Revolution in 1910, when they, they got rid of the king and declared a republic, also led to the formation 
of an anti-clerical state in Portugal. These sort of things were very deeply unsettling to, to people. And I suppose that, that sense of doom, which I suppose um, in retrospect is kind of much influenced by the fact that we all know what happened in August 1914 with the outbreak of the war and so on. That has created this sense that you know, the world was moving towards a kind of calamity. Even the story of the Titanic is sometimes represented uh, in that way as if the, the great ship was a sort of metaphor for European society at the time. But people at the time did believe that they were at the peak of civilization, that the world really couldn't get much more sophisticated than it was in the 20th century, and that we're on the verge of solving a lot of the, you know, the major uh, social problems of society. And to have all of this unrest going on was, you know, was deeply troubling. People felt there's something, you know, there's kind of an undercurrent in society which is uh, almost uh, malevolent. And in, in particular, they, they blame syndicalism. Syndicalism had, it come from the French word for trade union syndica, and it developed because in the 1880s, a lot of socialists were very puzzled that capitalism seemed to be much more persistent than they had imagined. And they were saying, why is it that the socialist parties haven't gotten rid of the capitalist system? And the answer was that the socialist parties had become dominated by intellectuals, by middle class people, by professional politicians. They lost you know, connection with the workers. So what you needed to do was to get back to the point of production, reconnect with the worker on the shop floor, and wage a struggle through trade union militancy. So you could see every strike really as a kind of skirmish in the great battle for society. And this would ultimately culminate in a general strike. And the general strike would be the revolution. And this idea was very much in vogue before uh, the Russian Revolution in 1917. So if you were on the far left at the time in Europe, chances were that you would be a syndicalist. So it's no accident that uh, James Connolly and Jim Larkin were both syndicalists. So, you know, the employer said, look, Larkin, he's, he's really a revolutionary. He's a syndicalist. He's an anarchist. He, he's not just about create, you know, improving wages and conditions. He's out to destroy society. And, you know, we have to stop this guy. So looking at things then in, in the Irish context, you can see that there, you know, Dublin wasn't on its own by, by any means. Uh, it was really you know, the end point of, of a series of escalating strikes, beginning with the, uh, the Belfast Dockers and Carter strike in the summer of 1907. Towards the end of 1907, you also had a general lockout in Newry, which began with a dock strike, um, which involved sympathetic action. And the, the merchants in the town then locked out their general workers. Uh, for about six weeks to, to break the strike. After Belfast, Larkin moved to, to Dublin. He was defeated. His tendency was to kind of move, move on. So he, he settled in Dublin. And in late 1908, there were a series of uh, strikes in Dublin. People were very conscious of what had happened in Belfast. They didn't want that happening um, in Dublin. And particularly, they didn't want a police mutiny. It was bad enough having a police mutiny in Unionist Belfast. Having one in Nationalist Dublin, you know, could be asking for a lot of trouble. So that, uh, that series of disputes uh, was settled generally in favour of the workers. But then in Cork in 1909, you had a lockout, the real lockout, as they call it in Cork. And uh, this was the first example of Larkinism without Larkin. He, had, he did go to Cork, he tried to get a settlement, but when he couldn't get it, he just went back to Dublin. And this is one of, I think, the kind of failings of Larkin. He did have a number of, he's a very black and white character, he, a lot of good points, but quite a few bad points as well. But if he was losing, he found it very difficult to face up to it. And he, he wouldn't call off the strike in Cork, because that would mean losing face. At the same time, he wouldn't go down to Cork and identify with his, his members either. So he just sort of stayed in Dublin and tried to put the whole thing out of his mind until after about three months, the dispute uh, collapsed and the, the employers ach achieved their objective. 
But then in 1911, you had, you had two rail strikes. Uh, the first was a national strike. It was part of a UK-wide rail strike, um, which is settled pretty quickly because there was a possibility of a European war over the Agadir crisis to, to do with Morocco and so on. But in September then of 1911, there was a strike which began um, as a result of sympathetic action. There was a strike at a timber yard in Dublin, and the employers deliberately tendered um, uh, goods to uh, Kingsbridge Railway Station, as it was Houston, as it is now. And th this was deliberate to see how the workers would react to what were called um, uh, black goods, goods that were coming from um, a company in dispute. So the porters refused to handle the timber. They were dismissed. Other people walked out. The whole thing led to a series of unofficial actions uh, right across uh, the railway. And the, to re-establish its authority, the, the union, the Amalgamated Society of Railway Servants, stepped in and called a national strike. So it never happened before, a national rail strike. And then a national rail strike, because two porters were dismissed at Kingsbridge. It was, you know, th this is really remarkable stuff. But the head of the Great Southern Western Railway, Sir William Goulding, he saw this as Larkinism on the railway, although Larkin himself wasn't directly involved. But the ism was there, and he was determined to smash it. So with a combination of strike breakers and the use of police and troops, he did smash the strike. And uh, the union was literally decimated in the manner of the ancient classical practice. Um, Goulding sacked 10% of the trade unionists, 10% of the strikers at the end of the dispute. And they gave a present of a clock to um, each of 121 station masters to mark this great victory over Larkinism on the railway. Now, William Martin Murphy was watching this very carefully, and he decided that's the way to go. That's the way to beat Larkin. So he was determined that if he got his chance, he was going to do the same. But other employers weren't so sure. They were very nervous about taking on Larkin. Dublin Castle didn't want to take him on because of the police mutiny in Belfast. So um, there was a possibility by the summer of 1913 of some kind of compromise being worked out. Of, um, the, the, the idea was that the unions um, would give at least one month's notice of any strike action, and in return, the employers would recognize the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, Larkin's Union. But Murphy was disgusted with this. He didn't want to compromise. He wanted to, to get rid of Larkin. So, meantime, there were some victories also for, for the union, notably uh, Galway, Limerick, and, and Sligo. You had a series of disputes there between 1911 and 1913. So it wasn't just Dublin. You know, it, it was a whole series of developments. And you'll notice that a lot of these workers were in transport, um, partly because transport was an important growth sector. Uh, according to the 1891 census there, just over 38,000 workers in transport by 1911, 62,000. Um, still a relatively small proportion of workers, but it is a, a growth sector. And it, transport is it's, it's really an essential industry, particularly because of coal you know, cities at the time ran on coal. You needed coal for everything to move ships and um, trains, power furnaces, provide home heating, uh, gas, um, gas lighting in the, in the street. Uh, and coal was, was heavy and bulky, and you needed a small army of unskilled workers to, to move coal. You needed dockers and, and coal heavers and carters and so on. And if you had a coal strike, you know, it, it affected everybody immediately, and there was a lot of pressure on to get the strike stopped. So it was like the Achilles heel of, uh, of the employers. And you can see a very high proportion of strikes in transport in Ireland compared with the UK average. So uh, one third of strikes in Ireland, uh, of strike days in Ireland, against just 4% in, in the UK. Right, um, so turn, turning to the lockout um, directly, 
Larkin's paper, the Irish worker, uh, pilloried Murphy, uh, call him a blood-sucking vampire, a soulless, money-grubbing tyrant, a white se sepulchre. But I don't think Larkin had anything personal against Murphy. It was just that that was the way he was. He, ha he had to put a face on the enemy. He, ha he had to personalize things. Um, you know, he would never deal in abstractions. He would never condemn the capital system or the wages system or whatever. He, he would select a particular employer. When he was in Belfast, he, he picked out Gallagher, the tobacco factor, and he attacked Gallagher. And Murphy was the obvious guy to, to go for uh, in, in Dublin. He also wanted to organize uh, Murphy's uh, employees, particularly on, on the trams. Um, Larkin had broken away from the National Union of Dock Labourers at the end of 1908. Uh, he'd become increasingly you know, headstrong uh, the more successful he became in Ireland. And he was the kind of guy who, who hated being accountable. He wanted to do what he wanted, when he wanted, how he wanted, where he wanted, and he didn't want to have to answer to anyone for that. So having to write these letters to Sexton and the um, executive of the union in Liverpool explaining, you know, he's gone to such and such a town and he'd address such and such a meeting and spend so much money and he needed travel expenses to go somewhere else. I mean, that really wasn't uh, the way he wanted to operate at all. And increasingly he just felt, you know, he felt constrained. He, there was also an objective basis to the differences between Larkin and, uh, and Murphy, uh, between Larkin and, and James Sexton. I mean, it wasn't just personal, the personal was the factor, but as well as that, Larkin realised that Irish employers were, were, they were much more militant than, than they were um, their counterparts in, in England. Um, industrial relations, uh, industrial conciliation machinery was much less developed in Ireland than, than it was in England. Uh, you needed more militant tactics in Ireland, and particularly the sympathetic strike, and that was really what workers found so attractive about this new syndicalism. The sympathetic strike is seen to be a kind of magic weapon that would finally um, you know, give them the, the resources to, to defeat the, the employers. Um, Sexton, on the other hand, just d didn't see things that way at all, you know, uh, as he saw it, you know, in, in Liverpool, the, the Carters, they have their own union, we, we're a dockers union, we don't want to be, you know, um, organising general workers and so on. So you did have the, these ob objective differences, and uh, that combination of the personal and the objective led to increasing friction between the two. And Larkin was suspended from his job at the end of 1908. So then in January of 1909, he formed his own union, the Irish Transport and General Workers Union. And again, the word transport in the title gives you an idea of the importance of transport workers. But um, to begin with, the, you know, the ITGW didn't engage in a lot of, um, it, it did, didn't undertake any industrial offences it was actually a fairly quiet union up to the summer of 1911 um, because um, Larkin was actually very careful with money, uh, with his own money anyway. He didn't mind spending other people's money, but uh, he, he worried constantly about money and he was worried that the transport union wouldn't survive as a dockers union. If these were casual workers. They might have the, the, the subscriptions one week, they mightn't have them the next week. So. What he wanted was to push into steady employment sectors, uh, like the, the railways and the trams. And he made repeated efforts to get the railwaymen, but the railwaymen insisted on sticking with the Amalgamated Society of Railway Servants, later the National Union of Railwaymen, later RMT. And this was a huge disappointment to Larkin, but it made him all the more keen to, to get the tramwaymen, because these men, they were they weren't very well paid, but they were in steady employment, and it would be a big asset to Larkin. So, so it wasn't that Larkin had some grand plan, you know, to control the labour movement in Dublin, uh, so he could kind of call strikes at will. I don't think that was, that was his plan at all. And I, I, he said he didn't like strikes, and I think he's right. Um, I mean, if you, if you look at his um, tactics, uh, you can see that he was. He formed a newspaper in 1911. 
He did two remarkable things in 1911. He, he bought the Northumberland Hotel, which he called Liberty Hall, and he set up his own newspaper. And that tends to be taken for granted, but it was very unusual for a small, unskilled, you know, effectively a dockers union, to buy a big headquarters and to set up his own newspaper. And, you know, the, the money that was spent on these things was money that wasn't spent on strikes. So Larkin saw them really as alternatives to strike action. He hoped that he, he could kind of, you know, excoriate employers in his newspaper as an alternative to actually, you know, calling out his men on strike in their employments. He hoped that um, rather than through strike action, he could build solidarity through making Liberty Hall, uh, you know, a social centre for, uh, for, uh, for, for workers. And he's very interested in this idea of developing an alternative uh, counterculture, you know, of, of promoting class solidarity through uh, culture. But Murphy, on the other hand, um, he did hate Larkin. He, he called him a mean thief. He expressed surprise that craftsmen should associate what he called scum like Larkin. And more to the point, Murphy wanted to destroy Larkinism. He said that business could not survive the, sy the system known as syndicalism or sympathetic strikes. And for the employers, Larkinism, syndicalism, sympathetic strikes, they were all the same. And Murphy told employers that the head of the labour agitation in Dublin has been aiming for a position that was occupied some time ago in Paris by a man called King Pato, who was able to hold up the whole business of the city by raising his little finger. That man was driven out of Paris and the other man will be driven out of Dublin shortly. So Emile Pato, he was the syndicalist leader of French electricians and he was famous for organising spectacular industrial action. After he disrupted a, a gala for the King of Portugal at the Paris Opera, he was uh, forced out of the country. He fled to, to, to Belgium rather than face imprisonment. So Murphy didn't make any secret of the fact that you know, his dispute with Liberty Hall was not about wages or conditions. Uh, it was about getting rid of this ism called uh, Larkinism. And he also wanted to, to destroy the efforts by the Lord Mayor of Dublin um, to bring about uh, some kind of compromise and get the transport union and the employers to accept um, this conciliation board. So Murphy got his chance then to, to tackle Larkin when the ITGW started uh, organizing the tramway men and workers in independent newspapers. Murphy sacked anyone who had joined the union and this put Larkin under financial pressure because Larkin had to put these workers on strike pay so he couldn't tolerate the situation indefinitely. So he called a strike on the 26th of August. Uh, he calculated it would have the maximum impact because it was the middle of uh, horseshoe, horseshoe week, not horseshoe week, horse, the Dublin horseshoe anyway. So Murphy then retaliated by uh, getting the employers to call a, a sympathetic lockout. So you can see there, the first phase, the escalation of the dispute from mid-July when the dismissals start and then you have the, um, the strike and then on the 3rd of September 404 employers uh, agreed to lock out anyone uh, who wouldn't sign the document and the, the document was a piece of paper saying that you weren't a member of the transport union or if you were you, you would resign and you would follow your employer's instructions. In other words you wouldn't take strike action or refuse to handle tainted goods so uh, by the middle of September, something between 20 and 25,000 workers uh, were locked out. So this is really a remarkable uh, phenomenon. I mean, a city of about 300,000 people at the time. So uh, you, it then enters its middle game. The, 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 the Board of Trade starts an inquiry. This, this was a new development to deal with what was called the, the great labor unrest in, in Britain. Be, between 1911 and the outbreak of the World War, you had this strike wave, very serious strike wave in Britain. Many people believed Britain was headed for social revolution. But um, it, it was kind of diffused with um, a significant improvement in conciliation procedures and the appointment of Sir George Asquith as the, um, the government's sort of troubleshooter to deal with strikes. 
Uh, Asquith became so popular as a result of that that he actually demanded a peerage from the government in 1919, which Lloyd George thought very cheeky. But Asquith uh, it was, was such a sort of established public figure that Lloyd George felt he couldn't refuse. So there really was no hope, I think, for that um, Board of Trade inquiry, but the government felt they had to kind of go through the motions anyway. And the uh, Asquith and the Board of Trade officials were really quite shocked at how implacable the Dublin employers were and how indifferent they seemed to be you know, to the, the poverty and social conditions in, in Dublin. So Larkin then starts his fiery cross. He's a great man for these kind of theatrical phrases. And at the end of August there, you had Bloody Sunday in Dublin when the, the authorities banned a meeting uh, in, um, in Sackville Street or O'Connell Street. It's, it's Sackville Street, it's kind of like the Derry London Derry business here, which you would be so familiar with. But uh, Larkin promised to be there. He, he went there in disguise and he, he, he sort of shouted, I'm Larkin, and then people moved to, to where he was speaking. He was actually speaking in the Imperial Hotel, which ironically was owned by Murphy. The Dublin Metropolitan Police then attacked the crowd and sort of waded in, swinging their, their batons. And um, it, something like 400 people were hospitalised in, in consequence. And he actually went so far as to chase people into the slums uh, uh, f following the, the riot in the street. But the British TUC was due to meet in Manchester um, a few days afterwards. So they, had a, they were meeting with this fresh in their minds and they were really shocked by the slums and the brutality of the police in Dublin. And it played a very important part in swinging public sympathy behind Larkin. Because Larkin was, you know, he's the kind of guy that a lot of union leaders wouldn't have been too comfortable with. Um, but even people like James Sexton, who, who certainly didn't like Larkin at all, uh, you know, he was all in favour of giving support to, to Dublin. But what kind of support could you give? What Larkin wanted was sympathetic action. He said, he, we don't want charity, we want action. But a lot of union leaders were against the principle of the sympathetic strike. Um, they felt, you know, it, it was just so difficult to contain. And the leader of the, of the Rowley men, uh, Jimmy Thomas said, look, if we support the sympathetic strike, the railway men will never be at work because, you know, we'll be asked to black goods constantly. So there, there was that, that problem. So Larkin um, began this campaign of torch-lit meetings um, in England to, to rally support. And th this is how he depicted in his newspaper William Martin Murphy. His home was Dartry Hall. You can see there a picture as a, as a vulture. But uh, Larkin became increasingly critical of the, the British Union leaders. Part of his problem was that this strike wave in England from 1911, it, it had thrown up this kind of new um, sort of breed of, of militants uh, called the rebels who were much associated with the Daily Herald, the Labour paper founded in 1911, and which continued to 1962 when it was sold off and changed its name to The Sun. So on the one hand, you had the militants and the Daily Herald. On the other hand, you had the British Union leaders. And naturally, Larkin was going to associate with the, the rebels. Um, and who were involved with the Daily Herald League. On the other hand, he needed the support of the union leaders if you know, direct act, um, sympathetic action was going to be sanctioned for, for Dublin. So he had to walk a fine line b between the two, and he just wasn't the man to do that. You know, he, he, he didn't have those kind of diplomatic skills, and if he had those sort of diplomatic skills, he wouldn't have been Jim Larkin. So inevitably, he became you know, increasingly critical of the union leaders. And he, this is a, a quotation from a manifesto published in the Daily Herald in late November. The British TUC decided that they needed a, a definitive response. Apart from that, now they're getting increasingly annoyed about Larkin's attacks on them. 
And what they did was to call a special conference. It was the first time the TUC had called a special conference. And the second time they called a special conference was in the miners' strike in 1985. So it was a really big deal. So they met on the, uh, the 9th of December, uh, 1913. Go back to that. And the idea was to, to, to ensure that, that, that they would make some kind of definitive response. And crucially, they voted overwhelmingly against strike action for Dublin. They said, yes, we'll continue the, the financial support, uh, but not, we, will, we definitely won't take strike action. So that was really that, because without the strike action uh, in Britain, there was really no chance that the employers could be forced to the negotiation table. But Larkin, of course, he had huge problems in trying to accept this defeat. And it was, um, it was about the 18th of January b before he finally was persuaded to, to call off the strike, to call off the struggle, I should say, and accept the employer's victory uh, in the lockout. So that's how it ended. And without question, it was a very significant material defeat for, for Labour and for the Transport Union. But of course, it's, it's remembered also as a kind of moral victory. But again, it, it needs to be set um, in, in context. And I know that 1913 is kind of seen as the labor year in the, in the decade of centenaries. But um, one shouldn't think that it was only 1913 that was of significance from a labor point of view at these years. This was a remarkable time in labor history, um, beginning, I suppose, in 1909 with Larkin founding the Irish Transport and General Workers Union which really did mark the rebirth of the Irish labor movement. Um, then you have the strike wave of 1911-1913, the lockout, of course, in the formation of the Citizen Army. Uh, but then you have the second uh, strike wave in 1917, mainly because of the, the war. The, the World War, it was the first industrial war. It created a labor shortage. It also created a shortage of uh, food and serious inflation. So it created the grievances, but it also created the means of redress. And then there was a feeling too by 1918 that the war had discredited the old ruling elites. They, they had blundered into this terrible catastrophe which caused the deaths of millions of people. And the end of the war was gonna see a sea change in how we govern ourselves. Uh, we're gonna be into a new age of democracy. Um, we wouldn't go back to the elitism of pre-1914. Uh, labor, trade union, socialism, they would all be much more important after the war. So you've got this big swing to the left um, in Ireland as everywhere else in Europe. And um, you have a series of uh, major strikes. Um, and then in 1921, you have, uh, you have the slump, which began really in 1920. 1920 was kind of like 2008. You know, everything was going grand in the spring. And then it all started to go pear-shaped in the autumn. So what happened in 1920 was that the war was followed by a short boom because people wanted to buy the things they couldn't buy during the war. But by 19, the autumn of 1920, there was a crisis of overproduction. And food prices were the first to fall. And then by the end of 1921, um, the economy was in severe slump and you had over 25% unemployment. So this gave the employers the opportunity for a major counterattack against labor. And, and labor, you know, the, the radicalism of the Larkin years is really crushed in the severe industrial conflict of the slump of 1921 to 23. But it wasn't just action, you know, there, there was this change of consciousness. People believed that labor was going to be very important in the New Ireland. And you have a lot of these publications. Um, James Connolly's Labour in Irish History, probably the most famous book uh, written on Irish labour. But the employers uh, commissioned their own history of the strike. They asked Arnold Wright, a London journalist, to write a history of the, of the strike. They, they must have known that they'd lost the propaganda war, that you know, they would be seen as the bad guys afterwards. So they wanted to get in first with their version of events. And then you have another contemporary history, Sean O'Casey's History of the Citizen Army in 1919. 
in 19, uh, also 1919, the first general history of Irish labour by W.P. Ryan, who was a sub-editor on the Daily Herald. George O'Brien's labour organisation is the first study of labour from an Irish-based academic in 1921. The second study of labour from an Irish-based academic comes out in 1977. And then you had numerous pamphlets and labour newspapers. And I finished off there with Liam O'Flaherty's novel, The Informer, because it seems to me to be kind of symptomatic of the way in which labour was sort of airbrushed out of history, because The Informer is actually about a guy who's on the run from the Communist Party of Ireland because he shot an employer during a strike. But when John Ford made his Oscar-winning Hollywood classic, he had the informer as a man on the run from the IRA. So it's sort of really um, indicative of the way people found it. By the 1930s, they found it difficult to believe there had been all this serious social unrest in Ireland. Even in, in Belfast, I mean, at the height of you know, the kind of political tensions about um, the future of uh, Ulster and we're on the, the eve of partition and so on, you still have this remarkable degree of support for, for labour. And you see there among the 37 unionists, six labour unionists, because Edward Carson too was very concerned about the growth of support for labour and the fact that it might take workers away from the official uh, Ulster Unionist movement. So he formed the Ulster Unionist Labour Association in 1918, and four uh, Ulster Unionist Labour MPs were elected in 1918 in that general election, as well as um, six on Belfast Corporation in, uh, in 1920. So uh, Larkin had gone off to America in October of 1914 He'd become very, very difficult to work with after the, the lockout, and people felt he was, he was, he was stressed out. Uh, it's known that he was seeing a doctor for uh, depression. Um, he was regarded as being you know, pretty much exhausted, and in fact, his friends suggested that he take a holiday to the US in the summer of 1914. But Larkin wasn't a man for holidays. You know, he, he didn't really know how to relax. But his, his, his way of dealing with depression was to move on and, and deal, you know, deal with other work. So he went off to, to America in October 1914. People thought he'd gone to get back his health and he'd be back in a few months. Um, he told people he was going to get money for the union. The real reason he went was that he, he wanted a new career as a global agitator. This is a time when labour was remarkably international and these global uh, agitators were not unusual. And the lockout had made Larkin internationally famous. There were rumours of him going to America in December 1913, and this led to an editorial in the New York Times, which, which is called Larkin is Coming. So uh, he hesitated. He was thinking of going to South Africa, and eventually decided he would go to the US. But the intention was that the US would just be the beginning of a world tour, that he would go right around, as he put it. But he never got beyond the US. Um, and he, indeed, he, he soon got tired of America. He wanted to come back to Ireland. But he, he applied repeatedly to the British consulate in New York for a passport, but they, they wouldn't let him back. Um, so he was imprisoned in 1920 on a charge of criminal syndicalism. Again, in reaction to, to syndicalism, the, the various states in America had introduced these laws making it illegal to advocate any kind of syndicalist uh, values or policies. And he was, um, he was given 10 years in jail and sent to Sing Sing. I used to think that Sing Sing only existed in Jimmy Cagney films, but it is, in fact, a real prison in New York, in Ossining. But he was released um, by um, the governor of New York. He was given a pardon in, in January of... Uh, of 1923, Alfie Smith, he was the first Irish American governor of New York. And again, what he would do was somewhat unclear and he hesitated and he sort of dithered between things. But J. Edgar Hoover, who would become famous as head of the FBI, was determined to get rid of him. He felt that 
all of the social trouble and unrest is caused by these European agitators who are coming over here with their un-American ideas and we want to get these people back to Europe. So he had him deported uh, to Southampton in April and he returned then to Dublin on the 31st of April 1923 and this photograph is taken, it's probably the most famous photograph of, uh, of Larkin. But if you look closely at the photograph, you find that nobody's really looking at Larkin, or at least nobody's animated by the voice and you know, the gestures. I mean, the bandsman is looking at him, but he's sort of, he's admiring Big Jim, playing Big Jim. Uh, the others, are, they've got their heads down, or they're looking somewhere else. It seems to me to say everything about the difference between 1923 and 1913, and Larkin's inability to see this, that, you know, as Larkin saw it, he was really coming back to the kind of world of 1913. But as others saw it, well, things have changed. Other people have taken over the union. You know, we're not going to let you re-establish your old dictatorial command. And this, this would lead to, uh, lead to a split in the union, Larkin's expulsion, and a virtual civil war in the Dublin labour movement, which continued at least until the 1950s and had a disastrous effect, really, on labour in, in Dublin in the middle of the century. And to give you an idea how bad this was, in 1934, Larkin's great nemesis in the Transport Union was William O'Brien. In 1934, the Transport Union published uh, a pamphlet on the lockout written by William O'Brien, and he never mentioned Larkin's name in the pamphlet. But uh, attitudes mellowed by 1963 with the 50th anniversary, and there was a kind of a consensus that, that developed that Larkin should be kind of remembered as a hero because you really couldn't celebrate the lockout without Larkin. Um, but a hero confined to 1913. We won't talk about what happened before when Larkin broke away from the British Base Unions. We won't talk about what happened after when he split the Transport Union. We'll just have him as the hero of 1913. And we don't want 1913 associated with things like syndicalism and communism and all that kind of stuff. Let's talk about the slums and you know, see it as a response to the slums and the terrible social conditions in Dublin, rather than what it was, an industrial dispute. So this is how, how Larkin is remembered in, the, in O'Connell Street. Um, obviously, the pose is based on, on the photograph. So in the end, Larkin won the propaganda war. There is no doubt about that. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for the invitation, and I hope you enjoy the, the talk. Thank you.